Okay, here we are with our next BIOL 3468 Biodiversity and Conservation Lecture. This one is Habitat Fragmentation and Biodiversity Conservation. As you probably can recall, I've been talking about habitat fragmentation and generally have been alluding to the fact that it's not such a great thing. In this lecture we're going to find out why it is not such a great thing. I'm going to find out what fragmentation is. And that's fragmentation of habitat, hab fragmentation of natural ecosystems. Uh, we're going to talk about natural fragmentation or natural heterogeneity in natural ecosystems. We're going to talk about artificial fragmentation and how it um, occurs, so the fragmentation processes. And finally, we're going to talk about the biological consequences of fragmentation. So, what is fragmentation? Well, humans impact on every ecosystem in the world. So humans are so adaptable and so able to um, use tools and different um, means to be able to inhabit or impact or use every ecosystem around the world. So human impacts will lead to some sort of impact on ecosystems wherever you are. Those levels of impacts will vary in severity to almost well, very light or almost non-existent. For instance, um, small groups of hunter and gatherers in a large area of forest through to complete devastation and habitat change as we would get in traditional European and Western agricultural systems, high intensity, which tend to be transferred to many other places around the world these days. Now, these low intensity impacts obviously don't change the ecosystem very much and don't change the habitat very much, so we're not so concerned about those. But it's the other end of the spectrum that we're worried about. These major changes to the natural ecosystems. Um, humans will generally need to change large areas of ecosystems to be able to grow their food and practice their agriculture and in some cases and increasingly um, to position their cities and uh, residential areas. But it's seldom that humans remove everything from the landscape. There's usually fragments patches and shreds of the original habitat left in the landscape as islands and peninsulas, inverted commas, in an altered matrix of human altered uh, ecosystem. So this picture gives a good example here. Um, we would have fragments and shreds of different of natural ecosystems all in an agricultural matrix. This looks like a like a cane farm, a sugar cane farm in either Brazil or in Australia, where all the flat land and the land that's not likely to get flooded has been uh, bulldozed for mechanized sugar cane cultivation. And it's only the areas around uh, water courses and in land which is too steep for um, mechanized agriculture which is left to the natural ecosystems. So we have a landscape which is largely mostly changed over to the human altered ecosystem but you have these shreds and patches and fragments of the natural ecosystem left. Now in terms of biode biodiversity conservation biodiversity conversation um, which is the most important habitat? Well obviously the remaining natural habitat has the highest diversity, the greatest number of species because the human modified matrix is modified to favor just one species and all the other species are effectively weeds and need to be eliminated by human agricultural practices. So we would have a diversity of under 10 species, plants and animals, in the cane fields and a diversity of 
over a hundred plants and animals in the natural ecosystem. So obviously in this landscape uh, we would really need to conserve the natural, the remaining natural ecosystems to conserve that biodiversity. And it becomes even more important when we realize that uh, this may be a unique ecosystem, an ecosystem which is only found in this area, and if it's uh, largely cleared, the only bits of that ecosystem which are left are the remnants, the shreds, the patches, and so on. So there may be species in these shreds and patches which are found nowhere else. So these are exactly the situations which exist in different parts around the world. Uh, for instance, um, in those same cane areas around Brazil, um, the Atlantic rainforests have been largely cleared for cane farming. And in the same way and in a similar sort of ecosystem, uh, the cane farms in North East uh, Australia, up around Cairns and Townsville, similarly have been cleared and a landscape like this is resulting. Both the Atlantic rainforest and the rainforest around uh, northeastern Australia are very unique, have a low, large number of endemic species which are found nowhere else. So these shreds and patches are quite often the last refuge of those particular species. With um, facts like these, and not only those two places, but a lot of island ecosystems and so on, um, the remaining habitat for endangered species is uh, confined to these sorts of landscapes. Um, we need to understand what is happening in these shreds and patches and how we can correctly manage this biodiversity to make sure it has the best chance of surviving. So let's move on now. What is fragmentation? Uh, much work has therefore been carried out uh, to the response of natural ecosystems in these remnant patches, these remnant uh, islands of habitat and how they survive and how they respond to this fragmentation. More work needs to be done on partial fragmentation and the nature of the matrix and its impact on the remnants of natural habitats. It's fairly easy in these mechanized agricultural areas where the um, habitat, the human altered habitat, is very distinct from the natural habitat, but in more uh, lower uh, economic, socio-economic uh, countries uh, that farmland is never maintained in that sort of uh, maintained so well so you would get lastro you would get trees growing up in that matrix which uh, can alleviate this fragmentation to a certain extent okay so more work needs to be done in that sort of context uh, most of the work has currently been done in the context like we would find in Brazil and Australia. All right, let's move, take a step back to natural ecosystems. Now these natural ecosystems are quite often naturally heterogeneous. So they're naturally fragmented. So in this example here, this picture of the southern part or a southern part of Nariva Swamp, Okay, here's Manzanilla Beach here with the uh, Kukal Road and look there's the bridge going across the Nariva River here and here's the Nariva River and all of this is uh, the Nariva Swamp. Now we have as you can see different habitats within that Nariva Swamp, a mosaic okay, of different habitats all fragmented and blended in together so we would have mangrove patches along the river here. We would have um, palm swamp forests a little bit inland and patches of palm swamp forest elsewhere. We would have patches of terrestrial forest like this patch, big patch out here. And we would have areas of uh, grassland and herbaceous swamp to greater or lesser degrees. 
scattered through the through the Nariva swamp here. So within this area, within this landscape, we have many different types of ecosystem. So this is a natural habitat. It hasn't been uh, totally devastated by humans. I mean, it has been affected somewhat, but not in an extreme way. So it is an example of a naturally heterogeneous ecosystem. Okay? So most ecosystems, most natural ecosystems, follow this example. They have a mosaic of different habitats. And the plants and animals which live in this landscape must be able to adapt to these different, uh, this type of mosaic of natural habitats. So if we have an animal which lives in the palm swamp or utilize the palms in the palm swamp, they must be able to fly to a different patch or move to a different patch over the water so that they can survive. Okay? And that's a filter which they have to pass through in, in, in evolutionary terms. Okay? In similar, in similar ways, the species which live in the um, herbaceous swamp needs to be able to cross over to a next herbaceous swamp if it's going to survive in this type of landscape. Okay, so if something happens in one herbaceous swamp, they can move to another one. So natural heterogeneity, in some ways, is very similar to artificial fragmentation. So natural heterogeneity is driven by two main um, drivers, uh, deterministic drivers and stochastic drivers. Deterministic drivers are basically things which are always there throughout the time, throughout, you know, for a long period of time. And they would be things like soil type, altitude, aspect, and one which I haven't got down here, which is very important, is rainfall. Okay, so they're there all the time, year on year, and they determine the mosaic of different habitats by changes in these parameters across the landscape. So here we have a natural savanna forest mosaic. Okay, uh, in some way these landscapes are determined by rainfall. Okay, but they may also be determined by soil. So if this was the Aripo savannas, this mosaic of forest and savanna would be determined by soil type. Okay? I don't know whether this is the Aripo savanna. It may be. I'm not too sure. Um, the other type of drivers of natural heterogeneity are stochastic or temporary um, elements or disturbances. These would be things like fire, storms, individual tree death or disease and they cause temporary heterogeneity in the habitat and the most obvious example of that is in a tropical rainforest where we would have trees dying and falling over in different parts of the forest at different times and they will create a mosaic of different aged forest okay throughout the forest so we would have a forest being a, a patchwork of mature and gap stage forest. And there would be some species which would need to move between those gaps because they rely on the release of resources which um, uh, become available when these gaps open up. So we would have animals which are able to move um, in this case over the matrix of the natural forest between the gaps. Okay, So natural heterogeneity driven by things which are there all the time or by occasional disturbances. Okay, So the plants and animals must be able to cross the unsuitable areas to reach the suitable habitat. Even in natural intact ecosystems. So that's quite similar to what happens in 
an artificially fragmented landscape. So here we have our uh, naturally fragmented landscape with your uh, repo savannas and the forest. And here we have a artificially fragmented landscape with the patches of um, ecosystems remaining on the tops of ridges, uh, maybe along the valley bottoms there and on some steep slopes. And in between it has all been cleared. Okay, similar sort of configuration of patches and shreds. Okay, uh, in a matrix of a rat, a different habitat. <laughs> so what is the difference then? It's still not completely known uh, what the differences between natural and artificial fragmentation are, but there certainly does seem to be a difference. There are three main distinctions which are thought to be important. First of all, natural patches tend to be very complex, have many different species, okay, and this tends to hold for most natural habitats, okay, within the landscape. So it's thought that because they're so complex in terms of floristics and in some cases in terms of structure, they are better able to provide the habitat, the hiding spaces or whatever um, that species need to cross over them. Okay, So it could be that natural patches of habitat tend to be quite complex and species rich. Okay, So even if they are structurally quite different they still uh, allow some corridor or some uh, stepping stones that uh, animals may be able to use to cross them or seeds may be able to disperse with those animals. A good example of that would be in a savanna. Most savannas, um, grassland savannas, do have some trees in them. Okay, They're usually quite scattered but there are trees in them. So for instance, birds may be able to fly from tree to tree in a stepping stone across those savannas. In uh, natural human, um, sorry, in an artificial human uh, landscape, trees are pretty much eliminated, particularly in those um, mechan mechanized uh, agricultural landscapes. Okay, so natural patches tend to be complex. Okay, but quite often their attributes can be similar in the different patches and that complexity of species composition will quite often allow enough um, of a similarity to uh, allow species to be able to disperse across those matrices. Artificial patches, on the other hand, which are cleared by people, tend to be very simplified and um, very different from the natural ecosystem patches. Okay. Um, also, and anyway, I'll, I'll continue with the three um, distinctions. Second distinction is structural difference between natural patches and artificial patches. Now, this is not always the case, but generally um, natural patches in a heterogeneous um, habitat are quite often structurally quite similar to another. Okay, So if you live in an area where there's enough warmth and enough rainfall, you are going to have trees. The tree habitats may be fairly different to one another, but you will still have trees. So structurally, they're going to be quite similar. Now, humans will impose uh, treeless ecosystems in areas where there is a forest, and they can also impose treed ecosystems in plantations in areas where there haven't previously been forests. Okay, so humans can radically change the structure uh, of their artificial ecosystem and make it very different from the natural ecosystem. And the third factor, which is also very important, is certain cultural features and human activities exist in this agricultural matrix, this human modified matrix, 
between the natural ecosystems which make very severe barriers to movement and uh, very make these matrix habitats very poor for use by native species and those things would be things like roads fences use of pesticides and herbicides uh, presence of introduced animals like dogs and cats and rats okay so certain features in artificial ecosystems conspire to make them less useful for the native species but there's one factor which I haven't seen in the book but which I consider to be probably the most important factor and the most important difference between natural difference between natural and artificial fragmentation and that is the fact that uh, natural ecosystems have existed for thousands of years a few thousand years and so the species which inhabit those natural ecosystems have adapted and evolved to those natural ecosystems and the species that you see there are the ones that can cope with moving around a naturally heterogeneous landscape okay so a species uh, a natural ecosystem is stable but when we go in and artificially alter and fragment a ecosystem it's not stable you're going to get species which are going to need to adapt to the different uh, type of um, configuration of the heterogeneity within the habitat and they are going to be lost okay so what artificial fragmentation represents is an environmental change and that's probably the biggest difference between natural and artificial fragmentation natural fragmentation has existed for years for thousands of years so the species which inhabit that natural landscape uh, have evolved to cope with all the difference in heterogeneity and you're not going to find species who can't cope so things are stable but in your artificially fragmented landscape it's still very recent so species are going extinct species which can't cope with that environmental change okay so that is why we would tend to find greater amounts of extinction in artificial fragmentation compared to natural fragmentation all right the fragmentation process i don't really want to say too much about this just to show you some examples of how fragmentation proceeds so we have some diagrams here this area was probably all forest at one stage okay they started recording how that uh, forest distribution is changing from between 1984 up to 2002 so almost what almost 30 years okay and as you can see the forest which is represented by the dark colors is progressively eaten away or cleared for agriculture okay initially it looks like forest um, covered about 75 to 80 percent maybe 80 percent of the area down to about 70 percent 60 percent down to about 50 percent whoops below half now so the natural habitat which was the matrix and the artificial habitat which was the uh, the, the patches and the shreds now switch so from 96 onwards or from 92 onwards you would have um, patches and fragments of natural ecosystem natural forest in a agricultural matrix 2000 the process continues the shreds and patches become smaller and they become isolated from one another until up to 2002 so two important factors they become smaller and they become isolated from one another okay oops we were up here as um, so you would get first of all gaps and perforations 
in the natural ecosystem. Those gaps and perforations will get bigger through natural edge, edge decay uh, means or by active clearing by the humans. Farmers want to increase their farms and make more money until the agricultural area becomes the matrix and the natural habitats are the islands. At the, at the perforation stage, natural community processes and natural communities tend to be intact and processing normally until the, um, until the uh, farmland becomes the matrix, passes 50% and the shreds and patches start to become um, isolated, okay? And then the whole fragmentation and island biogeographic processes which represent that uh, start taking effect, okay? What actually happens to the biota during this process is not clearly known, okay? It's thought that there are a few processes like crowding into the remaining remnants and so on which occur during this stage but nobody has really studied it or documented it. Instead what the fragment pro fragmentation processes uh, has mainly been um, assessed by looking at remote historical remote sensing imagery to see what happens uh, to the landscape as fragmentation occurs or what happens to the balance between natural and artificial habitats. Different species are thought to respond differently during the fragmentation process. Some would be able to uh, adopt the matrix as we will see later or be able to ignore the matrix etc and they will be able to survive other species will just won't be able to survive. They simply won't have enough habitat again for them to uh, survive, to live, and therefore they will go extinct. Okay? There are different and spatial and temporal scales for fragmentation. Okay, so some fragmentation may take over hundreds of years and some fragmentation will happen within a few years. Natural fragmentation uh, through deterministic processes uh, will often take over a hundred to a thousand years to occur. Okay, maybe sea level rise, how Trinidad was isolated from the mainland is an example of that. But on the other hand, artificial fragmentation can occur overnight, extremely rapidly. Okay, from one year to the next, an area has been cleared and fragmented. Okay. On a different spatial scale, fragmentation can occur at different times and at different uh, size scales. At a landscape scale, uh, people tend to study that the most. Larger and smaller scales tend to be less well studied. So smaller scales, what happens to species within the fragments and patches is not so well known. Okay. Now, species um, can survive this fragmentation process and some species actually benefit hugely from this fragmentation process. Quite often, these the species who rely on the gaps within a natural ecosystem. So for example, the species uh, in Trinidad which adopt the human modified matrix. So for instance, the species that you see on campus at UWE or in residential and agricultural areas like the Kiskadi, the Kingbird, the Tanagers, um, House Wrens, um, some of the orange winged parrots and so on. All of these types of species are able to utilize and find resources in the modified human modified matrix. On the plant side of things, the gap stage species also can do very well, like this Boacano or Cecropia tree that I have a picture of here. And we have a Kiskadi here, okay, which also is able to benefit hugely from 
the human modified environment. It's able to find resources and sustenance, uh, which is very similar to the gaps which are naturally found in a tropical forest. Okay? So you would find them in the human modified matrix. So species can survive fragmentation by adopting the matrix. And some gap state species, not all, but some gap state species can certainly do this. Another way in which a species can survive fragmentation is being small enough to have a small enough home range so that a large enough number of individuals can form a population that can survive easily in one fragment. So predators like this centipede and this um, shrew are able to survive in rainforest fragments because they're small enough in body size that their resource needs are small enough so that a large number, I think this is actually an opossum, okay, um, a large enough number can survive in a relatively small fragment so that the problems of inbreeding and other genetic problems and the problems of low population size which can be vulnerable to um, over predation through uh, hurricane damage through uh, um, chance events like fires and, uh, and so on. So a small enough or rare enough population can be lost from a population. But if the population is large enough within that small fragment, because you can pack more individuals in, because each individual uses less resources, then those animal the species can survive in the fragmented landscape simply by ignoring the matrix and living out their lives in large enough population in these fragments. The third way in which animals and plants can survive fragmentation is to be able to travel between fragments okay, as they would in unfragmented landscapes. So um, species which are very vagile or very mobile can travel between and cross the matrix and travel between the suitable habitat safely and quickly. Red brocket deer wouldn't say that it can travel between fragments safely but it can certainly do it quickly. Okay, So this red brocket deer is able to survive in a fragmented landscape by at night rushing from one fragment to the next. And there's a nice example in Western Australia where you have these rock wallabies. Now a wallaby is a small kangaroo, okay, about the size of a small dog, okay, and uh, you have wallabies which specialize in rocky outcrops. And populations would be centered on a rocky outcrop and not really have very much to do with the other populations. Genetic work on these populations of rock wallabies show that they do actually, or they are actually able to cross between these rocky outcrops through the uh, modified human wheat fields and cow pastures, okay, mainly on a deep dark night where there's no moon and they can move more or less undetected. And these um, immigrations and uh, so on have been shown uh, in genetic studies which show transfer of genes from one population to another which people were just previously not aware of. Okay, So species can survive in a fragmented landscape by being able to fly between those fragmented landscapes. Okay, Macaws are a good example of that in Trinidad besides the deer these big macaw birds can fly between the different patches of Maurice palms that there are in Trinidad, in particular Nariva Swamp and the Aripo Savannas, okay, to be able to access the seeds if they come at different times of the year. These um, red-bellied macaws which uh, feed on the Maurice palms are able to move from one stand to the next around the area of the Repo Savannah 
always finding fruit uh, even in the dry season. So species can survive fragmentation by either adopting the matrix, being able to travel between the fragments, and also by what was it? Oh, having a small enough population to be able to uh, have a large enough um, number of individuals in the population to survive the stochastic events which may happen. Okay, so some of those consequences of fragmentation, species that cannot adopt one of those three strategies to um, survive fragmentation will go extinct either sooner or later. Okay, so these are the processes which are thought to occur um, during fragmentation, okay, which can cause almost immediate extinction of plants and animals from that landscape, or may lead to unsustainable conditions over which uh, the animals aren't able to uh, surmount or survive, and leads to a slow bleeding and loss of species over time as uh, maybe for instance the adults die off um, but can no longer re reproduce because the conditions for reproduction are lost or species um, survive for a period of time but before inbreeding uh, reduces the fertility in the populations to such an extent that they aren't able to replace themselves and the population numbers dwindle and finally fades away. Okay, so initial exclusion is one of the first processes that we can look at in a fragmented landscape. If um, certain habitats are preferentially cleared over others, then the species which specialize and are not found outside of those preferred habitats uh, that um, preferred habitats that uh, are also preferred by humans to be uh, destroyed, then they are going to be driven to extinction in that landscape almost immediately upon the fragmentation. And this is known as initial exclusion. So many species are lost from a fragmented landscape with this initial exclusion. Okay. So, for instance, if humans uh, prefer farming the fertile soils which uh, hold their moisture longer in the bottom of uh, river valleys, but there's also natural species which specialize in river, the bottoms of river valleys, you are going to have a conflict there which is going to drive that natural species to extinction in that landscape. The next way in which um, species, next process by which species will go extinct um, during uh, fragmentation is the more long term. These barriers and isolation, um, this is where the matrix is very much, well, this is where the species which find the matrix uh, impossible to cross and therefore their populations become isolated okay so when their populations become isolated they effectively become smaller than the overall population in the landscape so even though the overall population in the landscape may be large if those populations are subdivided into smaller subpopulations which cannot uh, communicate with one another then each of these smaller populations are likely to be to disappear through burning disease storm events or something like that over hunting until all of the populations in the landscape are lost without any possibility of one population rescuing and growing up and helping another population so barriers and isolation um, of the matrix for some species allow this process to happen and can drive those species to extinction. Not immediately, but over the course of years as these 
biogeographic processes play out and one by one the populations in the different patches are eliminated through, I don't know, overhunting, outcompeted by uh, introduced species, uh, killed by a fire or disease and so on. Another way in which species can go extinct is through crowding events. So when you have species which are mobile, they can flee before the, the clearing which is going on. And once uh, they are all concentrated into the remaining fragments, you can have uh, densities of population of this animal which are unsustainably high for the habitat. And all these animals bunched together in a small uh, area uh, actually deplete that area and degrade that area until it can support none of them. So all the food is eaten out. Okay, so with these crowding effects, um, some species may degrade the remaining patches, okay, until um, they need to be, or well, until the carrying capacity of the habitat falls dramatically, and then so does the population of the uh, crowded individuals until they become extinct in that area. An example of that is kangaroos in Australia. In a farming landscape, the kangaroos are all uh, restricted into the, the bush lots or the bush patches left in the landscape. And unfortunately, the kangaroos will tend to eat out all the regeneration in those remaining bushes, in those remaining blocks. And so the trees will find it more or less impossible to regenerate and so they will die out and the kangaroos would die out as well okay okay local and regional extinctions this is basically metapopulation dynamics okay um, if a population in a fragment is too small to avoid demographic or stochastic threats and also they're too small to avoid genetic effects like inbreeding through inbreeding and so on, then they're quite likely to go extinct. Okay? Not immediately. Some of these processes will take time. Okay? And if there is enough communication in a particular species between fragments, in other words, some individuals are able to cross over the matrix occasionally, then these populations may avoid these demographic and stochastic threats and also the genetic effects. But if they're isolated, they're going to be very vulnerable to them. Okay, so these are some of the biotic consequences of fragmentation. Okay, there are some species which are particularly vulnerable to fragmentation. And these are the ones which we have seen previously, naturally rare species wide-ranging species, species which cannot fly or disperse well, and that's fairly new, okay? So species which cannot move across the matrix well will tend to be isolated in their populations, and so those populations will be picked off one by one. Low fecundity species and species with high population variability. So species with high population variability are always going to be rare at some point in time, which makes them more vulnerable to extinction. Low fecundity species are species with low intrinsic growth rates. Because of that, they are likely to not recover when they get some sort of um, stochastic event occurring which reduces the population size. Um, I'm really not too sure about the short life cycle, so I'm going to take that out, I think. Bye-bye. Um, large patch or interior species. Now these are the species which simply cannot tolerate uh, the edge effects, particularly, say, for instance, forest species. Some understory species um, in a forest,
require the high humidity and shade and low temperatures to survive. And if they don't get that, then they will die. Okay? So these interior species are, are in effect um, over-fragmented in that they own, can only exist in fragments within the fragments. And all the, say, a vast majority of a fragment may not um, be able to um, support them because they have a modified abiota due to edge effects and so on. Okay? So these species are particularly vulnerable to fragmentation. So what are some of the bi um, abiotic effects of fragmentation? Well, first of all, edge effects. Edge effects are the changes in light and humidity and wind speed um, at the edge of these fragments of natural ecosystems. Um, in particular, but also in other ecosystems as well, uh, things like light and so on. Moisture may change very much at the edge of these fragments and a plant and animal survival may be lowered by that and those interior species I was telling you about cannot tolerate edge effects so they have to migrate and live in a small area in the middle of the fragment. Okay. Also a consequence of fragmentation are changes in species composition as the species which cannot cope with the fragmentation drop out of the community. Okay, very few species are added in, and usually they're not. The ones which can adopt the matrix and um, use the increased amount of edges are usually increase in number, but uh, they don't increase their number, not in the short term anyway. That would take a few thousand years before some mutation or some uh, natural selection works its magic and changes the um, the species okay into something new and unique there's also changes in uh, ecological processes such as um, decomposition say so decomposition may be slow due to increased edge effect lower humidity and then therefore desiccation disrupting uh, invertebrate populations which decomposed the natural um, leaf litter okay so nutrient cycling may be impacted by this fragmentation and how it changes the abiota fragmentations and climate change i've talked about this before uh, fragmentation of an ecosystem prevents migration of those species to follow their preferred climate envelope, envelope across the landscape and in some cases up, in, up into the hills, up into the mountains to try and follow their life zone upwards. If it's getting hotter then many species, lowland species, may need to migrate up a mountain to maintain the lower temperatures. The problem comes when the habitat is fragmented and prevents the migration of some or all of the species which are trying to migrate with their life zone. When that happens, then climate change and fragmentation work together to create a situation where the uh, extinction rate is made a lot worse or much worse than if the than if the um, one process alone was acting at any one time. All right, so that's all I wanted to talk to you about, biological consequences of fragmentation and fragmentation and the con conservation of um, uh, bio um, biological diversity. Okay, uh, the main points are that um, uh, Artificial fragmentation tends to be different to natural ecosystem heterogeneity for various reasons. Okay, the fragmentation process can occur um, over different time scales, uh, from you know 
couple of years to hundreds of years or thousands of years okay and also the um, the fragmentation process proceeds from perforation to increase sizes in artificial communities until they take over the matrix role um, and then Maginot the natural ecosystem becomes isolated remnants and patches fragmented remnants and patches and we talked about the biological consequences of fragmentation okay I'm going to leave it there because I'm pretty tired after talking all that time so thank you very much for listening <laughs>